new from ESCO Institute. This is what people are saying about the ESCO EPA Section 608 Online Interactive Course. Great presentation and understanding of materials. The clarity of topics are consistent which helps the learning process immensely. The flashcards along with the excellent graphics and clear instructions are fantastic. I took the 608 core test before I came here and got 45%. After taking the ESCO course I passed with 85%. Do you need to get 608 certified? You will find the ESCO EPA Section 608 Interactive Course on the HVACR Learning Network. The HVACR industry's leading source of online and digital content. Visit us at hvacr.elearn.network. Well, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us once again on Did You Know the ESCO HVAC Show. So this week we're hanging out with Sinobio Aguilera. How you doing, sir? Good. All right, this is gonna be a very interesting conversation. So I should tell everyone up front that this is a little different than our normal HVAC or refrigeration conversation. It actually has a little bit more to do with plumbing and water, but it is absolutely HVAC. It is the refrigeration cycle that it's being utilized for heating water that is starting to migrate over into our industry. And I think it's a really important topic for us to cover and I really look forward to this conversation. Now, last week we spent some time down at the A.O. Smith factory in Tennessee learning about heat pump water heaters. The hybrid water heaters that are using heat pump technology are using refrigeration cycles for producing heat as well as our electric resistive heating elements. So it's a combination. So we're really looking at them as a hybrid system, but this is not hybrid. This is a standalone heating system, an inverter driven. It's not necessarily a heat pump because we're only really operating in one cycle. That is the heating cycle, but it is completely refrigeration, but we're running on CO2, which is truly intriguing. And so we're gonna spend some time today talking about CO2 water heating systems that are inverter driven. So Sinobio, are we in the plumbing industry? Do we work on water heating products as a norm? So typically, no, we did not. Water heating or so was, you know, construction or, or I should say in the plumbing side. Yeah. But now with, with these newer units, whether it's a hybrid or even or so the uh, monoblock, yeah. uh, no, that is now an HVAC. That is now something or so we're going to have to do. Simply or so because now these have refrigerant in them. Yes. And of course, once it has a refrigerant, that's a track. Exactly. And not just regular refrigerants. We're talking about CO2 and natural refrigerant. And yeah, we've been intimidated by it in the past because we know that it runs under higher operating pressures, but it truly is a refrigerant and a refrigeration cycle. And that is for up to us to learn how to work on these. And that's really what we do at ESCO. We teach about the transitions that are happening in the industry and we prepare the industry, especially our educational institutes, on the new technologies and innovations that we need to be working with so that we can get comfortable. Because remember, it's just a refrigeration system with a refrigerant. It has different operating characteristics than refrigerants we have worked with in the past, but it's still just a refrigeration cycle using a refrigerant. The CO2 unit is, is new since 2012, mm -hmm. and that's 2012 in this country. Right. It has been in other countries a lot longer than that, but um, we're just going to be rather centric or so and only talk or so about, hey, you know, what it's here and what it's going to be doing. And of course, the, the new popularity of why everybody is now looking at heat pump water heaters or the monoblock systems, the hybrid or the, or, or the straight on electric ones. Um, this, is, this is now HVAC. This is no longer your, uh, your daddy's plumbing anymore. This is an HVAC product. Now here in the US, we do have some stigmas, not only with the new refrigerants, but with introducing the heat pump, water heating, or just water heating technology into the HVAC industry is not being well received. But when we look at our industry globally, 
Many countries have already transitioned into this technology and the HVAC refrigeration sector are the ones that are doing installations and doing service and doing diagnostics. And so it really comes back to us getting comfortable with these new technologies and, and introducing them into our curriculums. Well, um, CO2 has been used just in these supermarkets for decades now. So it was only a, a nice change or so where we started to go ahead so and put it into a, in a water heater system. And in which case or so, as with most heat pumps, and something or so we would look at, the monoblock unit that's here is the actual um, heat pump. That's, that's where the evaporator is. That's where the metering device, that's also or so where the uh, compressor is. And as, uh, as Clifton, as you've already mentioned, so it is an inverter. So it is a DC motor, a DC pump. Um, everything on here is already high tech to begin with. When we're looking at so operating range, of course, so we're looking at so at the uh, at the outdoor unit, you know, the, uh, the monoblock one can be outside, which now for that range, anywhere between 114 degrees Fahrenheit to the minus 26 degrees Fahrenheit. And of course, oh. at minus 27, it now, uh, and I, I do want to state, at minus 27, it will still work. It just will not be as efficient. Sure, absolutely. So it, it will it will still work below minus 27, just not that efficient. It's going to take you a little bit longer to get that hot water. That hot water temperature is going to come down a little bit, but it's still going to work even at temperatures below minus 27. Yeah, Bart, thanks for joining us. That's a really good comment. You know, they're starting to look like a chiller, and really that's what we're looking at is residential systems that are chilling water for cooling capacities and heating water for heating capacities. In this particular instance, we're just using the heating side. But if we step outside of the box and we think about big picture, we now can start utilizing heat pump technology to heat water or glycol or cool water and glycol and give us that media for exchanging heat indoors, just a little differently than we have in the past. Good comment. You're absolutely right. And, and one thing I would point out or so is that uh, on the unit back here, we uh, you would put in larger size water pipes and everything on here. The only thing or so is that for a demonstration as a regular trainer, yes. this worked for us. Okay. So I want to make that a little bit clearer so that way people don't look at it and then, then start thinking, oh, that's a really small you know, line set. No, um, it should be here so about an inch and a half, but because we're, we're so close, we're, we're not extending that tank out, which could be extended out again, 25 feet away. Exactly. Um, we want it pretty close just for, again, demonstration and training purposes. Thanks. One thing I, I would also say too, so the way that the tank is designed, this is for a residential setup. Yes. So what you see here would be for a typical, you know, family of four residential use. The tank does retain the heat, even when the unit is off, it does retain that hot water. And we've actually had it running and testing it for a good 24 hours. And the water is still hot, even though we've already shut off the unit, we've already added more water, we've already stopped adding more water in. But the, the tank was one of those amazing things or so that after 24 hours, it's still hot. I mean, um, when you boil the water on, on your stove, you know, how, how long does that, that hot water last you? Right. It's, it's no longer hot. <laughs> right. So now when we utilize a well-insulated tank for storing our water, we have extended service times off from that heated water that we have now produced. Okay, so let's do some comparisons between refrigerants that we would traditionally look at for some of these systems like R134A and now with our R744 or CO2. Let's look at some comparisons between the two just to start getting more comfortable with it. Uh, with a regular R134 system, you know, as you notice, we're going from a gas to a liquid and then back to a gas. And then as we continue that cycle with R744, we, we're not, we're, we're in a gas form. The gas how we would where we would almost assume would be in its liquid form it has those properties as yeah. it would as a liquid but it is not it is still in gas form and a lot of that has to do uh, again due to the its own uh properties within uh co2 if we go we already know so that if we go too low on the pressure so we're going to turn it into dry ice the thing is so is that we never get that close we are we are way above that and so we are in a gas form throughout the entire system. So since there is no condensation here, the, 
the uh, refrigerant itself or, the, or that temperatures we're going through um, is not it's not going down and then up or or at least cooling off. So we're constantly going up. So that's why it's able to retain the heat better because we're we're not cooling it off. So that's just where why with other refrigerants when we do have that condensation. So we we do have a little bit of of, of like play on that, mm -hmm. but not on this system. Okay. Um, as we know, so you know, CO two it's it's a natural uh, it's uh, it's a natural uh, refrigerant uh, finding in the natural environment. Um, it is used to be inexpensive or so, but again or so, costs have at least come down or so. And the fra it's, it costs fractions to go ahead so and run this over a uh, traditional um, hybrid unit. So we are saving a lot of money on that too. Uh, it does require a little bit more training, and that's simply or so because. Uh, it's if you if you were looking or so at a at a plumber, you're putting in the tank, you're hooking up water connections, you're not really worrying or so well on the HVAC side of things. Um, because of so that we do have you have a condenser, we do have a family, we have a, the evaporator, we have a metering device, we have everything or so all those other components that we do see in the uh, refrigeration system. So you do need a little bit more training on this side um, than a regular plumber does. So that's where we kind of have a sense that you're going to need a little bit more training. It's not like all of a sudden, you know, you're a uh, refrigeration tech and now you got to go and apply for that rocket science degree. It's, it's basically everything that you already know and what you're already doing. You're just, you're just now dealing with water. That's the only other thing. Absolutely. And I'm going to make a couple other changes here as I get onto that. I think I'm back on that main screen now. Okay, and like we talked before, there's no backup heat. So we're like on a lot of our hybrid tanked water heaters, especially like the ones we were looking at yesterday or last week, you know, a lot of times what we see is that we are utilizing a heat pump on a small BTU capacity. Then we still have our electro, electric resistive elements, typically 2,500 watts, sometimes 4,500 watts. So we have a significant amount of energy that's being utilized for that backup heat. Here, when we start talking about a monoblock, we're designing the entire heating load into the one unit. And then, of course, now our, our lower function capability. All right, thanks, everyone. <laughs> I don't know what the deal was there. Uh, everything was the same settings as normal. I just came went out and came back in. So something funky in the software here, like it did a couple weeks ago. Yeah, so when you see that minus 26, that's, that's what, between minus 26 and 114, it, it's going to work fine. Mm -hmm. um, it's like I said, when we get down colder than minus 27 that's just when it's going to take a little bit longer to go air so and heat up the tank uh the temperature is going to come down a little bit more it's still working it's just not going to be that guaranteed you know um, um ideal optimal uh conditions so that you were experiencing when it was a little bit warmer yeah absolutely i did have one person write me a comment on social media about an experience with this where they had a low super low ambient condition and they did have a um they actually had a system locked down and lock out on theirs but i can only imagine you'd have to get down below minus 26 before you'd encounter something of that scenario so i would Correct. assume you know very well insulated lines when you're in the northern climates but when we think about those operating conditions and it may not fit for everyone but when we think about the the applications where this is feasible. I think about the Midwest, this is absolutely feasible in the Midwest for many applications. And, and to kind of mention, so I do know so that uh, they did have these units up in Alaska and in Alaska, it was working fine. And even covered, even with the evaporator co cover uh, in ice and about uh, about four inches of snow on the, on the top of the unit, it was still working like it should. So. I, I'm almost going to have to say if it's working good in Alaska, it should easily work on the lower 48. <laughs> Absolutely. And one of the big reasons we are looking at our, our alternative refrigerants is when we start looking at our global warming potential, right? We look at things like 134A and then we talk about things like 744. Well, 744 is where we use as a baseline for monitoring or comparing refrigerants. So now we're talking about a refrigerant that has a GWP of one and an ODP of zero. So it meets all of those check boxes, right? Correct. That's really what yeah, we're and that's about. and that's the one nice thing about it. So because even even for our 134A, it, eventually it's going to have to we're going to have to use some other refrigerant that will do better than that. So our 134A will eventually get replaced with 
again, another refrigerator so that we'll have either zero GWP or as, as low as we can get. Yeah, absolutely. So the technology transition rule through the AIM Act has already started going through and chopping down the GWP requirements and the, the ability to use certain GWP refrigerants in equipment. And so most of those are falling in that 700 range. That's going to continue to drop, I assume, as we go forward mm-hmm. and we start having new expectations. But we also have local jurisdictions that are setting those numbers much lower. So when we talk about things like New York, which are really pushing for some drastic new legislation that is going to push that number down into the teens and single digits, and then we go, wow, that doesn't give us a lot of refrigerants to work with. If we step back and we go, yeah, it actually does. We just have to rethink the applications that we're using these refrigerants in. We have to Correct. look. And, you know, when, and when you mention New York, it's, it's, it's actually New York, Texas, and California that's starting to do that. Yeah. So we're we're looking there so at uh, at a totally new changes so for those states and then of course for for the rest of the country too. Cuz yeah. it's it's not just this is just localized in just one area or one part of the country. The thing is is that this will go to all 50 states and into the our into our, uh, US territories and everything but for right now these are the three states that you are seeing or so that's making a lot of these different changes and why you're starting to see a lot of these units so that are popping up in those three states. Yeah, absolutely. We used to just blame California all the time. Now we can spread the love a little bit. Yes. (laughs) And and California thanks you. (laughs) Well, and if we think about it, it is really because when we start looking at the U.S., right, the the coastal areas are being more influenced by international presence, right? You have more people traveling that are entering into the U.S. at the coast, and they talk about the different things that we have in other countries. And so now we start being you know, more realistic of what the rest of the world is doing. Because when we start looking at CO2 applications in the rest of the world, they're actually quite common. Here in the United States, they're not. So, you know, we're going to start from the coast and we're going to start working our way into the rest of the country. And we just want everyone to be prepared, right? So when we talk about implementing these into the program, right, Sinobio, we're not talking about just one of your classrooms. How many classrooms have you implemented your, not just CO2, but your heat pump water heating products into your HVAC program? So um, we have actually introduced here at, at, um, at uh, CET, Center for Employment Training, we've actually introduced it both in our HVAC program and in our green building program, uh, green building construction skills program too. So that's actually widened our range or so of how many schools and of course, how many students or so are being trained on that. We actually have these units so in nine of our California centers. Wow. So this is so where we're able to reach a much more broader audience. Our students are able to go ahead so and actually learn all, all of these new techniques. And then, of course, so we do have, you know, some trainers. So we, we open it up or so where we have, you know, contractors that can easily come in. And that's always been something or so too. Or so any contractor that wants to contact any of our centers so that actually have these units and they can come in or so and ask for additional training. Yeah, absolutely. All you got to do is scan that QR code. That'll take you right over to the Center for Employment Training. You can also, I'll throw this ticker down on the bottom too as we go back into the presentation. I'll leave that one up for just a little bit. All right. Like I said, any any of our HVAC or our uh, green building construction skills programs, both of them have these units in them. Absolutely. All right. So let's go through some things to be um, aware of as we move into CO2 style products. So um, as we kind of know, so because it is our 744, it is CO2, um, you are going to need a little bit more training. As we mentioned, so about that dry ice. Yeah. Typically, so since this this is the outdoor unit, will be outside. If there is any kind of a leak, it's going to be within the unit. The, this down over here that you can see is actually so that it's, it's where the water pipes would be. So only water is going through here. All of the refrigerant is in here so this is where all the uh, refrigerant is so if you have any kind of a leak it's going to be here now we did mention so it has an inverter fan motor it has a inverter compressor so if there's any issues with those of course that would be an hvac technician to go ahead so and easily replace and, and change those out uh later on we'll go ahead so we'll, we'll pop this open so that way you can kind of see the inner the innards inside of it. Yeah, that's so. exactly right. <laughs> so yeah, stay tuned. We're going to dive deep into that. Apologize for the audio connections that we're having earlier. Sounds like everything is running normally now. We still got quite a bit of things to dive into, especially when we start talking about you know the transcritical operation of these things. 
So again, so because it's 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 transcritical, or so it has very high pressures. But uh, one of the things, so that we kind of know, is that when we went from R twenty two, when we went to four ten a, we said, "Oh shoot, it's high pressures. It's right. it's scary. You know, it's something we've never dealt with." Well, now we're looking or so at at uh, at R seven four four. There's even higher pressures than four ten a. But right. as we kind of already learned or so with four ten a, is not so scary. It, it it's what we do. We deal with pressures. Yeah. So going a little bit higher again, not so not so really scary. And if I may say something or so, if this thing develops a leak, by the time you get there, all the refrigerant is already going to be gone. Exactly. <laughs> now I would say this is so within I was I was told so within the last ten years they've only had two uh, units so that actually leaked out in the field. So two within ten years is pretty good odds. <laughs> Yeah, I actually talked to the the president as well of the company, and that's what they're saying is that the the failure rate of these are absolutely minimal. So it's it's very interesting. I'm, I'm intrigued. So we think about that. We don't have the um, the refrigerant installation practices that could go wrong. We're talking about a right. sealed system that we're just connecting our water lines to. Right, and this is this is where the water lines would be from here, and then onto the tank, and then from the tank onto the house. Yeah. So we're not we're not really looking at a, at a lot to go ahead and deal with. And as I mentioned before, this is where all the refrigerant is. Everything is right here. Um, the one thing or so about this particular company yeah. is that if if there is a failure here, they replace this for free. Sure. So they'll come out. Um, so again, so that's that's not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds kind of appealing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And, and so one of the things that we talked about, too, is as we start looking at these new technologies, you know, the, the whys, you know, it's going to be driven a lot by consumer. So even as a contractor, if, if we're not ready to implement the products as a educational institute, if we're not ready to implement the training for them, they're going to be here whether we want them or not, because we're going to start having these rebates. And as consumers start looking for higher efficiency products that qualify for federal tax rebates, uh, they're going to start having interest in these. Yes. And that's the other thing too. So the, um, of course it cost is going to vary or so from state to state and even within the state from county to county, but you're, you're really looking at so at 15 year warranty on the tank, 10 years or so on the unit itself. Um, again, so you're, you're, you're really looking at so at a, at a great deal here on, on the value of what mm -hmm. you're going to be doing. So, that's that's again or so uh, i would almost have to say on the on, on a regular standard hvac unit um what guarantees do we really have there yeah. you know this is much better sure so let's talk about the operation of it let's get an idea of what we are seeing components at least from the diagram and then maybe we can walk over and kind of take a peek at some of them okay so um as you see on the diagram so we'll go with the uh the tank the right. tank is where the condenser is and um We'll try to swing the camera around and we'll t kind of take components off. But the water is coming from the house into the tank and uh, it'll, it'll, the cold water will come in, cold water, mark it so with the, uh, the blue, will come into the unit. At the unit is when it will start to heat up. Right. Once the water is heated up, it comes back out through from the unit back to the tank mixes at the very top mm -hmm. and then comes back out to the house there is a, uh, a mixing valve back over here uh, you can't see it unfortunately okay. we'll, uh, we'll, we'll kind of turn things around so that you can sure. and uh that one or so is is because again so we don't want too hot water coming in so we want the water so to be hot and warm but not of course scalding hot yep yeah, absolutely so that's what the that's what the valve is for uh, and as, as I may have mentioned or so before, we, we just went or so with uh, with this for demonstration purposes. We should have at least, you know, a, a, a good inch and a half piping. And of course, with this being outside, this could be in your garage or if you have uh, like myself, I have a, my, my water heater currently or so is in a little closet on the side of the house. Um, this is where you would be piping it in. And of course, so that to be outside. And if you're, you are living in, in the, uh, the northern states, you may want to insulate the lines. Yeah, definitely. So, 
you know, definitely insulate the line set and everything coming uh, coming to here. They, the company does make some uh, valves, which are, again, designed for more uh, colder climates, again, northern states. Uh, and then, of course, so from here, again, regular piping or so going back to the house. Excellent. All right. So when we look at our outdoor unit, we go back to our schematic here. So we'll see that we're utilizing a temperature thermistor for our outdoor tank so we can monitor water. And then on our indoor or our outdoor unit, when we think of a typical heat pump, when we think about like one of these model blocks, like if I was considering that to be like a, the shell of a ductless unit, I would expect to see a condenser coil. I would expect to see a heat exchanger wrapping around the outside. And then I'd have my fan. Of course, I have my compressor and my controls. Let's take a little closer peek at what we would see when we look inside of one of these CO2 heaters. Okay, so what we, we kind of did, we already kind of uh, removed yeah. the screws. So that would be a little bit easier to pull everything apart. Right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop down a little bit. And yeah, absolutely. Try to do my, my best fan of white. But, uh, <laughs> <There you go. laughs> what, we, what you can see is that here is the fan motor. Yep. Uh, fan blade, fan motor right behind it. Right over here is actually where the uh, water pump is. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the heat exchanger. So now in some uh, refrigeration systems, we'll see one. This one actually has three. And so what happens so is that we have the, the coil. I don't know if you can kind of see it, but it's wrapped around each three of these cylinders. And this is that heat exchanger right okay. here. So this is what's actually heating the water. So water coming in, water's heated here, and then from here, water's going back to the tank. Excellent. So this is where this is where all the action is happening right here. Sure. Um, we have the uh, the pump is right actually right here. The uh, metering device is back over here. We have our uh, electrical controls up in here, and um, don't want to really touch it because it is still live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, yeah. Just give it an idea of the layout of components to it, just so we see that it's not that drastic of a difference of components that we're used to seeing, except for the fact that we're adding a heat exchanger outdoor instead of indoor. And then in that heat exchange, we're just going to be you know, transferring heat from our shell into the water lines that we're going to move back into our in indoor tank. Mm -hmm. Pretty simple. Well, the water pump is not huge. It's, it's rather small. Um, but again, everything is is actually DC, so it's all inverted. So the the fan motor, of course, is uh, uh, an inverter. The compressor is an inverter. The water pump all using DC power. Yeah. So even the uh, water pump is also using DC power. Mm, so nice. we have we have another cost savings too on that. So is that we're not using that much electricity when we're running. Startup is basically the same as on, on any inverter. And then, of course, with, with all inverters, once we start running, that's when we start seeing that savings because we're, we're using almost about six amps, really, wow. so as, we're, as, as we're going through. So, again, that's a lot less electricity. So now, if you, if you, were, if you were actually thinking, so, well, can I hook this up to my solar panels? Yes, you can hmm. because we're not using that much electricity with this unit. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? And we start thinking about the utilization of renewable energy. Well, now we can start thinking about ways we can implement that into our heating and cooling demands of our structure. And this is how we can do that because we're using such low startup current on an inverter and even our run current. Nothing like we would look at with a traditional resistive uh, heating system. All right, cool. All right, let, let's dive back into this thing a little bit. So let's pull up, um, I'm gonna go ahead and pull some closer photos of what that heat exchanger looks like so we can get an idea of those elements. Would, so that's just a three tube exchanger. So right there is the heat pump that Sonobi was talking about, or the water pump um, there on the right hand side. So covered and accessible, DC fan motor, very easy to get to. There is the actual water pump itself. If we were to remove that cover, that's what you're going to see is a little DC water pump. So we're just going to be using a recirculating loop from the outdoor unit to our indoor tank. All right. So now let's go back and let's talk about operations of our refrigerants. Okay. So we're looking at, at 25.4 ounces 
of R744. So Amen. we're not looking or so at, a, at a large amount. We're looking at a small amount, simply or so because it's it's basically right here. The compressor is behind the heat exchanger. And so we're, we're not really, and of course, so we have the, the evaporator coil, but for the most part, everything is right here. Hmm. So, you know, we don't have a whole lot of uh, refrigerant. And as I did mention, so this is outside. So if there were any, uh, any leakage or, or anything else, it, it's going to leak outside. Uh, again, safe to do so. But uh, of course, so we, that's not what we're actually striving for, not what we're actually trying to do either. Right. Um, we do have the operating range. So we're around 600 PSI up to 1,600 on the high side. Uh, and again, it, they're, I've always looked at so they're just numbers, nothing to be really afraid of. Yeah. Um, it is, it is carbon dioxide. So, uh, I always look at it. So is that, you know, is it flammable? No. Will it as asphyxiate? Yes. But it's really only going to do that if I'm standing right here when it leaks. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, and again, or so if, if I was really that much of a, uh, worry i could just take a few steps back um 25.4 ounces is going to leave rather quickly yeah absolutely oh so, all right so let's let's do a little education on the the whole transcritical condition inside of a co2 system so as you when you're looking at so on the left side that would be even for a supermarket Right. We're on a supermarket, so it is going through gas, liquid gas, only because of, so we have a much more longer uh, range or so for that refrigerant to go through. And of course, we have multiple evaporators. Uh, when you're looking at a supermarket, it's basically everything or so that's being refrigerated, whether it's the meat, whether it's the ice cream, whether it's the, the milk, anything that's being refrigerated, it's one system. And uh, we're just varying or so the uh, temperature loads to each of those areas because obviously milk is at 32 degrees, whereas ice cream is not at 32 degrees. Right. Operating at temperature. <laughs> so uh, we want to make sure so that that range. So when you look or so at on the right hand side where it remains a gas, this is what this system does. It remains a gas. So we are using a little bit more higher pressures because it stays as a gas to go ahead. So again, for that efficiency in that heating the water. So that's one of the nice things it's all about using a CO2 unit. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so let's talk about BTU capacities. I've noticed with a lot of our hybrid units, we're talking about BTUs that are in the few thousands, typically in that four to 6,000 BTU capacity. And so if they cannot achieve the heating capability with the you know, the onboard heat pump refrigeration system, then they're going to utilize the supplemental electric resistive elements to get the BTU capacity up. So let's talk about um, capacities on these. So uh, the nice thing or so about this, and this is where I would say, so if, if you were to do this, and this is what that, that picture kind of shows you, if you were to set this up in your garage, right? Um, then this fan motor is going to produce out 27,000 BTUs of, of cool air to go ahead and cool down or so your garage. So that's more than a ton yeah. of nice cool air that you're going to be uh, refrigerating. But again, so that's if you actually wanted this in your garage. And of course, in your garage, it, uh, again, so it's not going to get minus 26 in your garage, hopefully. Right. But, um, think about application wise, though, that really does fit the bill, especially in some of our warmer climates. It's an ideal location to even help condition some spaces mm -hmm. slightly. No. Uh, 15 amps, you mm -hmm. know, so it does use, you know, a uh, 2A 230 breaker. Uh, but once it gets started, it's only using five amps when running. And that's again, that inverter technology. We're only using it. So what we uh, actually need. Uh, so again, so it's, it's perfect for homes. Uh, it uses less than 2000 Watts maximum to so go and get everything up and started and running and going. So right. this is where, you know, for solar panels, you're, you're thinking or so maybe going off grid or just, you know, just having that, that ability to go ahead so and have with solar panels uh, to reduce some of your electrical costs. This, this is it. Yeah. You know, going forward, we're going to be very aware as consumers of our energy consumption in ways that we can offset that. So when we start thinking about heating and cooling technologies, we have to be thinking about our renewables and the ability to utilize renewables along with it. So I yeah, absolutely see the, <laughs> the opportunity to utilize some, you know, solar wattage to operate some of this equipment. 
All right, and let's talk about the expandability a little bit. So what you're seeing, so is, uh, I believe or so is like even for apartments or even for, um, you know, senior citizen home, um, centers and, and homes and everything, uh, that's where you could go here so you can actually see them. Because the other thing or so about this is that you can go ahead so, and put them in series. So that way, so that it is, is cooling down, you know, much more area. And of course the tank sizes can get a little bit bigger than what okay. we're seeing here. All right, so we have some flexibility in that stored capacity as well. Okay, so let's, let's this look is what at we're looking at tanks. And these, mm -hmm. these, these are, would be all for residential. And when we're talking commercial, we can talk about even bigger tanks than what's actually pictured. So we have the uh, 43 gallon and 83 gallon and 119 gallon, again, situated so for residential use. A lot of hot water. Um, and the one we have here is is the it's the smallest it's the 43 gallon one sure oh uh, again family of four so it works and of course if you have a larger family or again and again we're also looking at so up to up to 25 feet away from where you're actually heating that water to we're actually pumping that water to our appliance and everything too the water will still remain hot hmm. You know, I was really curious when you mentioned earlier on the warranty of the tanks, because there's a lot of places in the country the tanks don't last very long. And so now I kind of get an idea of what we're talking about. So we're talking about the actual lining construction and the fact that we're not utilizing elements or gas for extreme heating conditions. And because of that same lining, so the tank retains the, that heat. And that was one of the amazing things that we found out is that even when we had the unit off, the water was still hot and the tank remained hot. The unit was running earlier, so it, it went here, so it turned itself off because well, we weren't using it. But the line set here is still hot. It is still very warm to the touch. So uh, right now it is, it is 132 degrees, you know, at, um, at the pipe. And, um, you know, in the tank itself, so we have, what we have found so is that even after 24 hours, it is, it is still hot. Um, so what is the recovery time? So when you, when you use up all the water, when you go here or so, and then heat it back up so far. So what we've been seeing or so is, is right around 45 minutes and less. So we have run it or so to where we've seen it or so at around 30 minutes to, wow. and that's when we, we just open up the water and we just dump out, and out and recover. Okay. So, and that's what we're talking about. We're talking about utilizing them in the classroom for, you know, doing testing as well. Because remember, these are new products. So, you know, there's not tons and tons of data. We want to make sure that we get this out to you so that you have the opportunity to take a look at them and go, you know, maybe it is time that I start re-looking at our program and bringing in some newer technologies. If I'm already teaching inverter technology, right? I'm making a transitions in my classroom. I'm bringing in inverter technology to teach in a classroom. Why would I not want to start teaching about other opportunities utilizing that same inverter technology like in domestic and commercial heating products? Right. And like I said, we're... We're, we, we are we are a school, we're not a house. So of course that usage and everything will go ahead so will vary, but we try to get it as close to what you would see, you know, in a house so when we're actually testing for the students and everything too. So we yeah. have run it or so, and like I said, we, we have run it or so for a good hour and a half just to see or so, well, how fast is that water? Is that temperature gonna, gonna fluctuate? Or um, it, it's still pretty good. So we haven't, we haven't really found any bad things about it but yeah absolutely um, I, I i always look at it this way so i i have these in nine different centers so we have nine times the available information or so that we can test and see and that's what we're going to be doing yeah absolutely one of the questions came in from uh, from murphy on the freezing of lines when the tank is satisfied and so that was one of my earlier concerns and because i actually had someone send me a comment about one that had, in the northeast had frozen and i'm curious if it was one of the previous models that didn't do constant recirculation remember with that pump we're actually doing a circulation so even if the temperature is satisfied we're still circulating hot water yeah. through those so if pipes. anything so on the on the pipes there there is a uh, a cold water valve down over here and so obviously this is this is not the cold water valves, but if it was, you can go ahead so you can actually switch this for a much more cooler climate for again, for those areas that it's going to get snow. Um, we don't really get snow out here in Southern California, at least not by the beach. So uh, so again, so when, and then of course, these water lines that would be coming or so from the unit to the tank should be insulated again too. if you if you have just bare pipe, 
you're, you're almost you're almost going to get that the that uh, that water freezing up. So uh, again, so the recommended manufacturer is to go ahead and make sure so that they're insulated, and of course, so I'm I'm, I'm going to throw it out or so that if you're you're in Oklahoma, you may need you know a certain uh, insulation as opposed to North Dakota. Right. You may need a little bit thicker, much more bigger insulation or so on your pipes, just like you would or so with a, with a regular heat pump uh, HVAC system, uh, an air conditioning system. It's the same thing or so that you we would be doing here so with the water. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. So I do want to pop Hope back. that answers the question. Yeah, I think so. And, in, and we'll get some of the installation manuals available. I'll try to tag those in the description so we can get some links to the products. You can learn more about the product. Remember, we weren't really trying to sell a product here. We just awesome. wanted to introduce the technology into the classroom so that we're aware of what changes we actually are already seeing in the industry. Yeah, and absolutely. Constant circulation would make a big difference. All right. I may have lost Zenobio there. I don't think I've got a video feed coming through. Anyone have any questions while we're right here? I'm not a... Uh, I'm not an expert on this, but I've definitely spent some time here with Sonobio learning about the product. I've actually talked to the manufacturer of the product to learn a little bit about its introduction into the market. Remember, we are talking about an inverter driven system. So we have, you know, a variety of capacity levels that we're able to, to run at, you know, depending on the demand of it. You know, we are using DC pumps, DC motors. All right, there's Sonobio again. Yeah. Okay. We weren't too sure because we, we kind of lost you there. Yeah, lost just for uh, a minute. Okay, so let's talk so about this is what we're looking at. So 80 percent saving over a, over regular electric resistive water heaters, over forty percent savings over hybrid heat pump water heaters. Okay, so those um, are some big numbers. Yeah, we're, we're costing those that, that value now. Um, like, like I said, so we're we're kind of getting that from the manufacturer as the school as we're running and testing these, we're finding so that it's doing much better than the published findings so that the company yep. is actually printing out and, and sending out to the public. But it's, it's, it's exceeding a lot of those expectations is what we're finding. Yeah, and I can see that. That could be an average. When we look at some of the areas where it's running in colder climates, you know, we're going to have less of a COP when we get into those colder conditions. And that's really what we're talking about. How are we talking about these energy savings? We're comparative, you know, we're using the coefficient of performance of comparative analysis between like we're talking about electric resistive heating element. We're talking about a COP of one versus using a inverter heat pump technology where we're actually being able to run in three and a half four COP really getting some very impressive numbers out of this. And so those are going to vary across the nation, depending on the cost of your electricity versus your cost of gas when we're comparing, you know, towards, you know, like a gas water heater. But that's what we're going to start doing going forward is understanding the technologies that are out there, understanding that, in just a few years, we're not going to have traditional gas furnace or gas water heaters or traditional electric water heaters. We're going to have, you know, uh, higher efficiency models of both. And we're going to have a lot of rebates for our hybrid heat pump water heaters as well as our true monoblock water heaters. And that really kind of falls into us. So we, we have a lot of opportunity to add the technology into our classrooms and the manufacturers are, are hoping that we do and that we can elevate that education so that we can be prepared for this. The, the last thing we, we want to do is to make a transition into high efficiency inverter driven you know, water heating devices without having an industry that is ready to understand these, install them and work on them. That's what it comes right. down to. Yeah, absolutely. All right, a lot of good stuff out there. We're rounding close to the hour, so let's talk about installations real quick. And um, it is, you know, this is the important part that we like to bring up, Bill, is that it's a different type of heating water, right? The recovery times are fantastic. The technology, you know, we're preaching inverter technology in all of our HVAC programs. You don't hear inverter being taught in the plumbing training programs. Right. So it really kind of falls on us to be that component of the industry that, that knows what is happening with this technology. So it may not have been something we looked at in our program in the past, but it's something that we need to start looking at very seriously. And thanks for joining. Right. This is where, you know, when it comes to install codes, uh, obviously, so you're going to want to go ahead so and use whatever codes or so that pertain to the Warrior. state and city and county or so that that you live in or so. Uh, and again, so I know. I do know. So even for for the for the unit itself, in uh, in some of the more northern states, you're going to want it above the snow line. Obviously, in California, we don't have to worry about that. At <laughs> least not in Southern California, where I'm at. 
So you know that that's going to vary. Now there is one thing or so that I do want to kind of point out that uh, that when you are installing or so that you're going to be kind of relieving pressure on this. So if I if I may, and, um, so one thing or so that we found out so that when we were installing, and I'll, I'll move the system back a little bit so we get a little bit of the angle, is that of course when you're hooking in the water pipe, you're going to get air trapped inside the system, and it is mentioned in so the install guide. But what you're going to do is you're going to you're going to come to here, and at this point you're going to you're going to relieve air pressure here. So this is your this is your first spot of relieving your air pressure. The second spot there's a there's a valve underneath where my hand is actually touching. That's the second valve that you're going to need to go and release the air pressure. And of course, so we're allowing for that water to come in. It's basically right underneath where the water pump is. Oh, okay. So as that water comes through and as that water is then now going back on the hot water side, you would then be relieving your air pressure here. So it's it's one, two, three. Huh, so okay. three places is where you want to go to sort of leave that air pressure when you're installing. Um, we, we have it up on wheels, obviously, to, to move it around. But I would say this. So we did put it up on some blocks. And that is something actually even the manufacturer will say. They, they do make a, a kit. Um, but we went in so and utilized this wood blocks to kind of lift it up just that way so we can get our hand underneath, be able to go ahead and do that adjustment and then pull it out. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we, we, we're trying to make it so, again, or so because we, we are teaching, we are using this training or so, we, we did make a, a few adjustments. So, of course, that would be different if you were installing this permanently in your home. Yeah, yeah. We inst I would install it just like a typical, you know, mini split. Exactly, and that's and that's really so what you want. You want to install this just like you would as a as a typical mini split unit that what you have in your home. Yep. And for the most part, you're, you're only doing the um, of course the water lines and um, just to again to go ahead and say they, they should be at least you know the galvanized pipe. Um, I mean, you could go ahead so and even if, I guess if you wanted to use copper, you could go ahead and use copper too. But again, it it really depends upon the area where you live in, and of course, so with your outdoor temperatures. So I don't want to. I don't want you to tell. I don't want to go ahead and, and and tell somebody to use a certain kind kind of a pipe, and it's and, and they're up in Montana, and uh, of course now they're now they're calling us to say, hey, uh, I use this type, and it's it's cold over here, and it, it's changed so. Uh, obviously, you know, use the piping or so that you're going to, that you should be using or so in any, of course, any installation uh, codes that you would have to do with water pipe. And I know that's where it's a little bit different because on an, on an HVAC system, we are usually insulating only the, uh, the low side lines. We usually typically don't insulate the high side lines or again, in some cold areas, you may insulate both on here. I would go ahead so and go ahead and insulate the lines so they're coming from the unit to the tank. Sure. So and again, so insulate them to the temperatures that that are that's actually in your part of the country. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I was actually reading through some of the literature for this particular product, and it really helped me think outside of the box just a little bit. So I won't go into specifics on it. I would encourage everyone to look through the installation manuals for this. But if you had a particular BTU load on a structure. It actually has the capacity to provide not only to the domestic hot water, but the heating capacity for that structure. So when we start thinking beyond just hot water, domestic heating, and we start looking at heating solutions, now we have a CO2 heating product. Not just hot water domestic, but conditioned space heating. And so that's what I want people to start thinking about, thinking about where our industry is moving to, thinking about the new products that are going to solve solutions, solve problems that we have. So these are solutions to problems. We think about the lack of fuel sources in some areas. And when we have electric and we have sized it properly, now we have the opportunity to utilize hot water for all of our eating needs. Okay. All right, I think I'm gonna to start to wrap it up. Let's leave a little bit of time for any questions at the end. I wanna make sure to get our contacts back up for the Center for Employment Training. 
And I don't have any for the particular product. Remember, we weren't here to sell a product. I did have one question that came in, uh, where can I buy one in Virginia? Well, you'll have to reach out to your local distributors or you can hop on their website. Sinopio, do you know what website that they should go to take a look at? Um, Ferguson, I believe or so, um, is actually ca carrying this line. But um, you should go ahead or so and then contact this, this line in particular, Sanko. Yes. Uh, go ahead so and, and at least contact them and find out. So again, for which uh, which dealer that is in your area, because I, I don't want to want to go ahead and mention a, a local dealer that may be for me. Then obviously it's not for you know the rest of the country. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up for the day. I don't have any other questions that came through. Sonobio, we sure appreciate you hanging out with us today. Love learning about new products and technologies and helping our industry. Stay current because there's a lot of people out here that would look at this product and go, wow, I've never heard of such a thing. And then when we see it in your actual classroom, we go, oh, we've got classrooms that are teaching on this. Is my classroom ready to start teaching on this? And now I need to start thinking outside of the box a little bit of how we prepare for the future of our industry. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, David, glad you uh, had an opportunity to hop in here from Cincinnati and we apologize for any of the audio connections. You know, I had changed my audio setup here a few months back and went with some really sophisticated technology. And I'm finding that I've had more problems <laughs> than I need to. So I'm gonna be switching back to my old school that I've been using for years that was a, a, you know, a no fail. So yeah, thank you for joining us very, very much. And we'll see you all next week on Did You Know? The ESCO HVAC Show.